So we're going to talk about understanding preventing physician burnout. Uh, this was a tricky presentation to put together because it was like every single week, new information kept coming out about this. It's like a hot topic for you guys. What, what's going on? Do you guys, I'm, I'm curious intuitively, why is this a topic right now that's being well researched and like studied right now? Why? Any, any guesses? Questions on that? Thoughts? Yeah, why? What do you say? Millennials? <laughs> that actually is one of my thoughts. I mean, yeah, millennials have a definitely a different attitude towards workplace and that, that sort of attitudes. Uh, someone said about work hour restrictions or something like that, too, maybe? Yeah, so maybe since they're studying a uh, different duty hour gaps. Hmm. Okay. Any other ideas as to why now? Yeah. So like bureaucratic nonsense is adding to your all stress and burning it all out. Okay. Better tracking? Maybe that, yeah. Perhaps that. I don't know, I'm just curious like what, what you guys think is going on here because again, it's like every single week I was getting emails from other physicians and friends saying, Oh, here's this research that just came out, here's this data. So we're going to go over some of that data and then on some of the just ways in which perhaps we can try to curb it, the burnout. So what is burnout? Here we go. Uh, so burnout, the term was uh, coined by a psychologist, Dr. Herbert Freudenberger. Berger. It's a good uh, psychologist name. Uh, in 1984, he worked with drug addicts who would maintain these blank looks and have that thousand-yard stare where they were just holding a cigarette. And it was burned all the way to the end. And so, like, they were, you know, and we've all seen that, right? It's sort of like this, you know, there's something you're supposed to be doing, but you're not taking action on it. And that's basically, he saw a similar behavior uh, occur among staff and in other professions, where there's someone that you have a job or a task to do, and you lack the motivation or enthusiasm to do it. You're starting to, you're just not reacting to the stimulus in your environment in a way that is good for you. Um, and so, um, yeah, so job burnout is characterized by exhaustion, lack of enthusiasm and motivation, feelings of ineffectiveness, uh, and may also have uh, the dimension of frustration or cynicism as a result of reduced efficacy within the workforce. So you feel like you're not doing a good job, you don't really care. Bottom line. Uh, it's not an official DSM diagnosis, and I, I kind of think that's a good thing. I mean, in one way, in other ways, it's not. It's helpful because this helps me in terms of combing through research. Uh, every time they change the diagnosis in the DSM, it's like, okay, uh, like, for example, depression, you know, it used to be, you had to be somewhat suicidal. Well, not everyone that's depressed is suicidal. So there's a whole lot, large amount of people that were, you know, from the 1970s or earlier on that you don't get in that data. Uh, this sort of helps us to look backwards and forwards in terms of the research out there. Basically, we're just defining burnout as people that are stressed out to the point of maladaptive behaviors and passivity. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we're going to go over some statistics for, regarding physicians and burnout. Uh, this part kind of blew my mind coming together. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of go over some major points here, but then talk about why I thought this was really kind of insane. Um, let's see how looking at Okay, so if you look at med students and residents compared to the general population of the same age, uh, what we see is that, let's see, you said I can click it, maybe. There we go. So what you see over here is 27% of physicians are reporting uh, symptoms of burnout compared to perhaps to around, around 7% of the general population. It's, it's obvious you guys burn out more than the general Joe Schmo out there working at the same age of you all. Suicidality, this one is awful. 11% um, of physicians, of, and it was, or I'm sorry, of residents and med students, I'll put it that way, um, have uh, given symptoms or, or been diagnosed with suicidality, meaning it's not just a passive suicidal thought. Suicidality is where you are making gestures, planning, or you've attempted suicide and even completed suicide. 11%, the general population is around four. That statistic is right in line with folks coming back from active combat duty. A lot of these statistics kind of overlapped with that. That, that was what kind of blew my mind. Same thing with divorce rates and other relationships or stressors and that kind of thing. 
I'm curious, uh, just to know your all's reaction, does that seem intuitive? Does that seem high, low? What do you guys think? It seems really high. Okay. A little over 1 in 10, right. That seems high, okay. Anyone else think that seems accurate, or anyone else think that seems high? Over? I think, so like asking other physicians, they also get it seemed high, but when I looked at the data, I think part of what's going on now is people are talking about this stuff. I think perhaps uh, previous med students, residents, physicians, that had some sort of uh, suicidality going on, didn't probably talk about it, it was kept under wraps. And so I think that's the change we're seeing now. People are starting to talk and open up about it. Yes? Um, so it's the egg thing. Do they only, do they do those before they became physicians or medical students? Their level of suicidal thoughts and then afterwards? This was just present as, like, of residents and, you know, medical students who's presently suicidal. I mean, I don't want to make a association, but maybe certain sort of medical personality goes into it. I would no, and I wonder that too. That may be it. So you think suicidal people are more likely to? You have to have some sort of self-destructive personality trait to go into this field. That's actually something Mike and I talked about. No, I think that's a good. That's a good hypothesis. Again, there's a lot of good data out there, new data, and I'm, I don't have the answers as to why or what's totally behind it. That's why we're just starting to kind of uncover this stuff. But yeah, I think that may be very much part of it. Um, reporting at least one symptom of professional burnout, and that, this one, I, okay, it's, it, it's, okay, one symptom, we're all, okay, that, that's surprising that's only a half. It seems like, mo- and only 36% in the journal population. I would imagine it would be a lot higher, but, I mean, and you'll go over here in the next few slides what they're looking for. Uh, they do an Oldenburg index of burnout. And then alcohol abuse, that's the big one. So 34% of physicians have reported abusing alcohol in the last month compared to 9% of the general population. Is that surprising? No. Okay. <laughs> you might have uh, like a little bias with the population that comes in and works with you guys. But um, I mean, that's, that to me seemed about right. I mean, that's what you see with other high, like other careers and professions with this sort of intensity to it. Lawyers have a similar high, uh, alcohol dependency or alcohol abuse, I should say, rate. And we're not talking about dependency. We're talking about you drank more than the recommended three drinks in a night, that kind of thing. So, but there, one, of the, one of these other studies in here, I don't have it on the slide, was there was a direct correlation where if you had um, shown one sign of burnout, if physicians had shown one sign of burnout within the last month, had a 90%, um, yeah, 90% uh, chance of having abused alcohol within the last month as well. So we know this. There's a little direct correlation between how people, when they're stressed out, and how they drink. They're going to something for relief. Okay. Uh, well, do it over here. There you go. Other symptoms of burnout, spillover, that's basically where you're not maintaining your boundaries. So you come home, you had a hard night, and you go and kick the dog because he pooped on the floor. It wasn't, you know, it's not like it's something you normally would do. You're basically allowing that workplace stress to come home. And that goes the other direction, too. A lot of physicians have reported to me at their home, uh, you know, their, their spousal relationships or their home arguments and fights that spills over to the workplace. It's like you have this inability to maintain your personal and professional boundaries. That's a big symptom of burnout. Um, is this ball of emotions, alcohol or other, uh, uh, alcohol or other drug abuse, we've talked about that. Um, other acts of escapism, so typically when people are stressed out, they do something that distracts them. That can be positive or maladaptive, you know, playing video games or, um, you know, drawing or doing art or whatever. But it, if you do this too much, it becomes a problem. If you're avoiding work because of it, or if you're doing, uh, avoiding other life obligations, this is no good. And this is what we're looking at more of, is acts of escapism in the, to the point of you're not taking care of other life responsibilities. Uh, not caring or compassion fatigue. You know, you have a patient that you assume they're all drug addicts. You know, they're, they're asking for, they're talking about pain, and you're like, okay, this person's just opioid seeking or whatever. I'm uh, seeing some looks, okay. Um, and making mistakes. That's the one that, that is most concerning, I think, from the like hospital or the large, well, from just every level, making mistakes on what's going on with the patient. 
Um, and then again, and lastly, extremes of behavior, rash, non-self-promoting, or self-destructive decisions. That's just like up and quitting out of the blue. Um, that's like, it was a few years ago, that guy that like carved out the UK logo on the woman's womb during a C-section, something like that. You remember that? Yeah. It's stuff like, you hear, like, it makes the news. Stuff that's like kind of just, just like, for this person letting himself just go nuts. Um, we can also, there's a lot of data on burnout by specialty. So I'm kind of curious, what do you guys think, what specialty do you think is most burned out or most likely to burn out? Surgery. Surgery. Okay, that was, wow, all right. <laughs> Emergency medicine, okay. Who else? Care. Critical care. What do you think is the least likely to burn out? Neurology. Neurology? <laughs> and someone said pediatrics, radiology, okay. Well, I heard one other one over there. So here's what we got. Uh, you guys intuitively are correct. Emergency medicine, 59% uh, burnout rate. Are showing, I should say, 59% are showing symptoms of burning out. Uh, OBGYN is next. Family medicine, that, does that surprise anyone that family medicine's third down? Yes, no, maybe? Who said yes? That's a, how come? I, they just seem so chill. Yeah. <laughs> They've got the polo shirt and the khakis on and look like they just came off the golf course, but apparently they hide a lot. That's so yeah, anecdotally I was asking my some of my physician friends and clients like I was going over this day, I'm like, why family medicine? Because some of them did think exactly like, you that'd be at the bottom. And like, oh they're all warm and fuzzy. But then some doing a little more just sort of anecdotal data, it's having to deal like the stuff you have to deal with that is severe feels awful. You know, if you're, you know, bleeding heart for kids, you're going to have a hard time when that kid's diagnosed with something fatal or terminal or whatever. Uh, that, that was one theory. I don't know if that's what's up, but... I think the best might be that they don't think they get paid enough for, like, the amount of work that they do. Okay. Like, uh, primary care doesn't pay as much as it should pay. That, I, I think that's something Michael and I were talking about. That was a good theory, yeah. I think that makes sense, too. Any other theories as to why... Some of these intuitive or non intuitive ones at the top are so high up. You spend a lot of time on non patient care activities, like what kind of medical records? Yes. Okay, that's. Some of them. I bet you're. Uh, that's a good one. At the bottom of the list, uh, is psychiatry and mental health? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me, but does it surprise anyone else here? No? Okay. I, I think they're the ones kind of looking out for this kind of stuff, would be my guess. And I think the workload and stress load is probably a little less than perhaps emergency medicine. Um, allergies and immunology. Okay, that makes sense, right? Um, and ophthalmology, pathology. No offense to any of these. You know, if you're not burn, this isn't a contest. You can burn out the hardest. <laughs> but I think, I think it intuitively makes sense when we see this list what it may be causing burnout. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, reported causes. So we've, we've kind of identified other things like perhaps pay, perhaps the work environment, uh, perhaps uh, bureaucracy, what have you. Other guesses, guys, as to what may cause, what people are reporting as causing burnout amongst doctors and physicians. What's causing this problem? Lack of autonomy. Lack of autonomy. Okay. Litigation. Litigation. Okay. Like lawsuits and having to be like, and that kind of falls with lack of autonomy, I'd imagine, too. I'm having to be really cautious about what I do or if I'm doing the right legal thing. Crap, don't make mistakes. Other guesses? No. Okay, so here's what we got. The t very top of the list that kind of sticks out the most is too many bureaucratic tasks, spending too many hours at work, feeling like a cog in a wheel, that's a measure. Um, and increasing uh, computerization of practice. So you guys are on it. I think you guys get it. You guys are understanding this. Um, so, and that feels right, guys? I mean, it's, you got, that's a problem? Lots of bureaucracy, lots of computer notes and stuff? Anyone feel like a cog in the wheel? No? Okay. So, effects in the workplace. So when burnout hits this critical point, the organization will suffer. It creates this breakdown amongst team members and this sort of that workplace stress, a toxic environment. Uh, and that could be between doctors and social workers or nurses. Um, and it just builds. It's contagious, you could say. 
So one person, you, you guys may have worked on a team where it was obvious someone was not giving their all, right? I mean, it goes back to like high school, college, you know, if you're in a group project and someone just isn't having it, it kind of ruins the group, right? And so that's kind of obvious. Uh, so there is a handout um, that I gave, and you guys don't have to take this right a second, but it's going over the Oldenburg uh, burnout index. And if you just look over this, what they were looking for, they're looking at um, basically how, how are you relating to your job? Do you feel like you have a lot of efficacy with your work? That's a big indicator. Do you feel like you are... Um, how stressful are you finding the work and how satisfying are you finding it? Those are the big three kind of areas it's kind of asking over and over again on these questions. So, for example, I find my work to be a positive challenge. During my work, I often feel emotionally drained. So you guys can look over that and if you have, just get a feel for what is generally causing burnout or what we're looking for here. And that's the other side of it. So I won't go over that line by line. I'll save you guys that. So let's talk about prevention and relief. Um, so every article I came across in research that talked about how do we deal with burnout was just basically dealing with stress. How do we reduce stress in the workplace or in your life? And so the big one is exercise. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty new kind of idea coming out of uh, evolutionary psychology where the idea is a lot, the reason there's a lot of mental health problems now, perhaps not so much in the past or reported or whatever, is that we exist in a time where your psychological stress and your physical stress are not in line with each other. So if you think about hundreds of years ago, your primary job may have been working in a field so you ate. Thousands of year, years ago, it may have been like, you know, hunting buffalo or chasing off bears or invaders or whatever. The things that mentally stress you out are the things that are physically stressing out as well. And now we live in a time where we are mentally stressed and taxed all day long, but physically that's not happening. And part of what they're saying back to stuff is we know starting at age 20 you begin to lose brain mass. And, but they've studied these folks, these longitudinal studies have studied folks that they call super agers. That's that old guy that's like still ice skating and like, you know, really active in his community and just doesn't stop. He's like sharp as a tack. And what they found is this person, these people aren't like exercising like every single day or anything like that, but what they are doing is pushing themselves past their comfort zone. So wherever that may be, three times a week. So if you want to quickly like get your mental health in line, it might not be the best for your heart or other parts of your body, but if you want to quickly get your mental health kind of back in line, do something that really taxes your body. And three times a week. And it also helps with brain mass. So some of the studies on that, uh, or one of the ones around burnout specifically, was doing a aerobic exercise program. I believe they were having folks just exercise for 20 minutes, uh, three times a week. And they looked at different measures. So um, this is the left-hand side, I don't know if you guys can read it, but it's the, after five weeks of just regularly doing this, uh, the folks in the study, they had a reduction in anger, that was pretty obvious, a excitation lowers, and the positive uh, sort of emotions and relations, the uh, elation calmness uh, increase, competitiveness, competitiveness decreases, that might be hard to give up, um, fatigue and depression also decrease. This continues to be uh, a greater spread after about nine weeks. So we know just exercising makes a difference. How many of you guys exercise, by the way? How many of you guys have time to exercise? Okay, yeah, 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 okay. Most of you guys do? That seems right. Cool. Does that help you? Do you feel like that is helpful for your stress, for your workload life? Yes? No? Okay. I see him nodding. Um, another th way of understanding or dealing with stress is simply what's called emotional literacy. So when you have a job that's, you know, where you're really in your head and trying to problem solve, or you're the type of personality that is sort of just, you know, lost in ideas and thinking, uh, you're not really paying attention to what's going on emotionally or in your body typically. And so just simply checking in with your body, like right now even, what are you feeling? We're always feeling something. And we feel our feelings, they're processed in, in your, throughout your body. And so understanding, okay, oh, I'm having something here, what is that? Am I angry right now? Am I happy right now? Sad, scared, whatever. And understanding where you're feeling and what you're feeling 
can be helpful just simply to take a change of action that's in your betterment. Uh, and so, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Most, I mean, this sort of shows what are typical, uh, where people typically feel their emotions through their body. So anger, for example, people will report feeling it in their hands. You make a fist when you're angry or your chest. Um, depression is this, uh, is that third one from the bottom. It's like people talk about feeling this heaviness in their arms and legs that they can't take action. And that's behaviorally what happens with depression. You don't take action that you typically enjoy. Uh, happiness is sort of radiated from your chest and head throughout your body. Shame looks like Spider-Man. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> what did you do, Spider-Man? Um, but it's in the eyes. I can't unsee that. Um, a few of these guys look like other superheroes. But, but just taking a minute throughout your day, it's that simple sometimes, of just checking in with yourself. What am I feeling right now? Where do I feel that? And most emotions don't last but 20 seconds. There's a rule in like psychology or... Uh, uh, that what is, pers- uh, what is suppressed will persist. And people spend lifetimes suppressing emotions that maybe last just 20 seconds or less, at most. They avoid it, they work, they use drugs, whatever it may be, because they're avoiding an emotional state. And so just simply checking in and then figuring, and like, what am I feeling? Well, here it is. Another way of doing that is, uh, this is a CBT kind of tool here, it's the emotion wheel. So, um, I won't go about in crazy detail here, but basically understanding what your feelings mean. When we're happy, it means we're getting what we want, or we're achieving our goals. Happy and anger are actually the same emotion on a spectrum. Happiness is we're getting what we want, mads we're not. Mads is just your body telling you, a goal's being blocked, or you're perceiving an injustice. And it's not a negative, there are no bad feelings from this idea. If you're angry, it just means you need to take action to solve the problem to get what you want, to get what you need. Use that energy. Um, scared and sadness. So scared is telling you threats of loss or threats of harm that are in the future. It's an anticipatory emotion. It's getting you ready for things that are not here and now, but may be coming your way. The problem we tend to have is we tend to overpredict or predict poorly what's going to happen next, especially if you go way far out. So if you recognize you're scared, look at what is a real threat to you. And hone it in. And what do I really need to be doing right now, at this moment? You know, if you think about 99% of the time, like at this moment, there are very little threats, moment by moment. So this can be helpful to center yourself. Sadness, if you're feeling sad, is typically around the what's the past. It's about those threats or losses that are being processed and realized, that have occurred. And again, what tends to happen with sadness, especially with busy working people, is we tend to suppress it. And we, we avoid it, and it kind of drives these other unhealthy behaviors, uh, such as burnout. <coughs> Any questions on that chart? Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, maybe? No? Hmm. Looks like yes. Okay. Um, stopping and taking a breath, as simple as it sounds. Uh, this is a really simple tool called Foursquare Breathing. The idea is when we are stressed, we tend to hyper or hypoventilate in some way. We're not breathing in a way where we're getting the right... Uh, mixture of oxygen, carbon dioxide. I think you guys could probably explain that to me better than I could to you. Uh, but a simple tool of getting that regulated and correct is what's called four square breathing. So here we'll all do it together. So if you, on the count of four, you take a breath in. So breathe in. One, two, three, four. Hold that. One, two, three, four. Exhale slowly. One, two, three, four. Hold that. One, two, three, four. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. Breathe out, one, two, three, four. Hold that, one, two, three, four. Now, I would pay attention if you guys are following along, but if you were, you might notice it feel a little calmer. And it's that quick. Now, folks that are having a panic attack, what they're doing is they're not getting that right supply of oxygen and the right combination of oxygen carbon dioxide in their head. And when they slow down and breathe, it tends to dissipate that panic attack. Does that make sense? Maybe, yeah? Okay. Mindfulness. Any of you guys familiar with mindfulness? This is like the buzzword in psychology right now. Everything, be mindful, take a minute, center yourself. Um, I'll walk you guys through a quick mindfulness exercise. So you can do this anywhere. Just in the moment, in the room, choose a object within your immediate focus. Watch it for just a minute. 
could be, well, we're not outside, so we're not flowers or insects, but it could be the chair, the back of the head, the person in front of you, your hands, your paperwork, whatever. And don't do anything except notice it. You're not reading it, you're not judging it, you're just taking in that stimuli and relax with it. And just allow yourself to concentrate on it as though you're just seeing it without, for the first time, without judging it, without putting a story around it, just observing it. Let yourself be consumed by this in this exercise. <laughs> and just see how you feel. And breathe with that. It's really simple. The trick with mindfulness is we are basically taking a step out of our thoughts and putting ourselves into this objective observer position of ourselves. We're observing what we feel, what's in front of us, the stimulus in front of us. You know, we typically might look at things in the environment and our brain is quickly putting a story around it. So I could be looking at this chair and I could say, oh, okay, it looks like it's comfortable or not. That's a judgment. Or I could look at the chair and recognize it's, it's black. It's got holes in it. And just observe the shape for what it is without making predictions or stories around it. Does that make sense? Any of you guys practice mindfulness? No? Might be something to look into. Um, lastly, ask for help. That's a lot of things. I think a lot of the personalities that are attracted to this field are, you know, well, don't like to ask for help. They like to, like we were talking about with suicidality or other issues, uh, want to uh, do it all themselves or not admit mistakes. And you're not capable of that. And it's important that you do ask, you know, looking for social supports if you're not asking. Is that hard to do at U of L med school? No? Good. And I'm, and I'm curious, what questions do you have about all this? I mean, I've, um, about what you guys can do yourselves, or any of you guys feel like you're burning out that want to admit that? Any thoughts in general on burnout? No. You guys are just all calm and zen right now. This has been wonderful. Okay. Do you feel like any of those things would be effective to help out when after my C month or you feel stressed or you have a patient suddenly die five minutes after you walk out of the hospital? Or not? Puppy day? Is that what you said? Oh, puppy therapy. Yeah, no, that is certainly a strategy. They looked at folks that uh, they were not responding to blood pressure medication, and they were looking at people with high-intensity type A personalities, and they gave them a dog or cat to take care of. And they found that where the medication wasn't helping them when they played with the pet, it reduced the blood pressure in a way that medication wouldn't. So yes, changes in the environment are, are, and playing with puppies, that kind of stuff, are important or useful. I mean, I think some of it was, a, yeah, you know, reading exercises yeah, yeah. Ask for help. So it, was, it seemed like it was, this was focused more on like individuals, but I think it's more like a, a system. systemic issue. Yes. Yeah, no, a system that promotes pathology needs to be challenged. And I think that's something that is like, I don't know, I mean, there's a lot of tradition in medicine, right? There's a lot of, this is how my father did it and his father did it. This is how it goes back to the Greeks or whatever. And challenging that kind of thing, is it really good? I mean, are there things you think are unhealthy within your health field? Can I, can I be so bold to ask that question? Are there, are there unhealthy things going on in your health systems? No. Have you had to stop the surgery? <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> are they unhealthy people? None of them are in the room, right? That's stress. I think they're unhealthy, a, a less than healthy system, maybe. Some of their grand rounds, like scrambling on the patients on the floor, like doing rounds out there, but discussing, you know, that you're talking. So they feel like helpless to deal with uh, the inevitable burnout then? If it's beyond just the individual, if it is the big system, yeah, I see some nodding, and I get that. So how do you challenge the system? How do you guys create, I mean, that might be something where millennials do with something good. Is they're, they're resisting, you guys are resisting what are otherwise abusive workplace practices or practices that are not good for everyone. I don't know how you would do that, but.
Yeah. Other thoughts? Guys, I really appreciate your time. Um, thanks for listening.